Report 1. Understanding the Diagnosis. I had this little mark on my nose that had gone on for three, four months that I thought was from my glasses. A friend of mine, when I was swimming, she saw a mole on my back and became very concerned. It looked like a blister, and so I did, really didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, tried to keep it covered up uh, with powder and so forth. It is not always easy to know what is normal on our skin and what isn't, but nearly a million people in this country find out that the unsightly spot on their skin is actually skin cancer. The good news about skin cancer is that the vast majority of cases can be successfully treated if detected early. There are three main types of skin cancer. 80% of skin cancers are the easily treated basal cell kind. A second type, squamous cell, is found in 15% of people with skin cancer and also usually responds well to treatment. The third, malignant melanoma, occurs in 2 to 3 percent of cases. It is the most dangerous, but can be successfully treated if caught early. All three types of skin cancer are caused mainly by too much exposure to the sun. For a basal cell or squamous cell, one of the highest risks is cumulative sun exposure over the years. For melanoma, it's not only cumulative sun exposure, but it seems that it may be how many severe sunburns you've gotten. Baby boomers' love affair with the sun is showing up on their skin 10 and 20 years later. That's the case with Sean Hughes, who developed melanoma. We'd put on the old baby lotion and we'd put on the cocoa butter and looking for that perfect tan. At the age of 26, it caught up with me. Skin cancer is growing in incidence faster than any other cancer. To better understand cancer, Let's look at how normal cells can turn into cancer cells. Our bodies are made of millions of cells. As cells become old, they get replaced by new ones. New cells are formed when an existing cell divides into two identical cells. Looking inside the nucleus of a typical cell in the body, we see long twisted bands of material called DNA. It contains all the instructions on a body's makeup, like height and eye color. DNA also tells cells how and when to divide. When the DNA becomes damaged, for example, by the ultraviolet rays of the sun, in the case of skin cells, the damaged DNA can no longer tell the cells how to divide. The cells, now without proper DNA instructions, begin to divide at an abnormal rate. Over time, as these abnormal cells divide rapidly and uncontrollably, they form a mass of extra tissue. This mass could be cancerous. The spread of cancer cells from their original location to other parts of the body is called metastasis. Metastasis is when a cancer cell is broken off from the original spot and then spread to another area of the body, and that can be an organ or it can be another spot on the skin. The skin is the body's largest organ, shielding us from sunlight, injury, and germs. Most skin cancers are found on parts of the body that have been exposed to the sun's ultraviolet rays. Let's take a closer look at the structure of skin and where cancer develops. The skin includes three layers. The innermost layer is predominantly fat. The middle layer is called the dermis. It contains hair follicles, sweat glands, and supportive tissue, including collagen and the elastic tissue called elastin. When the sun's rays penetrate the dermis, they eventually break up the elastic tissue and collagen, creating wrinkles. The top layer is called the epidermis. It acts as a protective coat. The epidermis is composed of three types of cells, basal cells, squamous cells, and melanocytes. When basal cells divide, they push the older cells upward, causing them to flatten. These flattened cells are the squamous cells. The star-shaped melanocytes produce melanin, the substance which gives skin its color. 
When skin is exposed to ultraviolet light, more melanin than normal is released from the melanocytes in order to protect the skin from damage. This darkening appears as a tan, although it signifies damaged skin. Sometimes the melanocytes grow in harmless clusters and appear on the skin's surface as molds. If squamous cells are damaged by ultraviolet rays, they may divide abnormally and form a mass. This is a squamous cell carcinoma, or cancer. If the mass forms in the basal layer, it is called basal cell carcinoma. And when the melanocytes grow out of control, the result may be the most serious form of skin cancer, malignant melanoma. Everyone gets exposed to the sun, so why do some people get skin cancer and others don't? The number one thing skin cancer patients have in common is fair skin. Lighter skin sometimes does not have enough melanin to protect it. Skin cancer does develop in a small number of African Americans, but usually appears on lighter skinned parts of their bodies, like the palms or the soles. The tendency to get skin cancer runs in families, partly because skin types tend to be inherited. It is also believed certain genes might contribute to skin cancer. Melanoma can occur in a non-sun exposed area. That means it's not related to the sun exposure, and it's really because of a genetic predisposition. So anybody that's had a mother, father, brother, or sister with a melanoma is actually at a higher risk and should be very careful and get careful follow-up. Jack Cheney spent much of his life in the sun, shirtless and hatless. I just went along and, and got the Irish tan where you would just burn, get freckles, and they would all meet. That was until a doctor saw an unusual spot on Jack's back and did a test called a biopsy to see if the spot was cancerous. We deaden the skin with a local anesthetic, and then we take a small piece of skin, either by shaving off a raised bump or taking a punch, which is like a small cookie cutter, takes a small core sample, and we send this to the laboratory. It's looked at under the microscope. Jack's biopsy showed a melanoma at low risk of spreading. It gives you a different outlook on life. You know that you're not Superman anymore. As we've discussed, the three kinds of skin cancer basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma are due mainly to too much exposure to the sun. So protecting your skin from the sun is crucial in preventing more skin cancer. More about that in our next report. Report 2. What happens next? The severity of your condition and your overall health will determine what happens next after the diagnosis. The truth is, some things in your day-to-day -day life may change. You will need to take personal responsibility for scheduling doctor's appointments or remembering treatment plans. And you will want to know what may lie ahead for you. I'm a very healthy person generally, so it did shock me that I was told I had a cancer. Being told you have skin cancer can indeed be alarming, but with proper treatment, most skin cancers are curable. First, your primary care doctor may ask that you be evaluated by a skin specialist called a dermatologist. Many skin cancers can be treated right in the doctor's office. Patients who need more extensive treatment will have to choose a surgeon. This might be a dermatologic surgeon, a general surgeon, or a plastic surgeon. In some cases, you might be referred to an oncologist, a doctor who specializes in treating cancer. After treatment, you will need to have follow-up visits at least three times a year until your doctor says yearly exams will be okay. Your general physician will often want to do full body skin exams at every checkup for the rest of your life. But a patient's best weapon to detect a recurrent or a new skin cancer early 
is regular self-exam of the entire body. Now, if you have a mole and it changes in any way, if it spontaneously bleeds, if it changes color, or if it changes in size, then it should be checked out. The American Cancer Society recommends a self-examination guideline called the ABCDs of skin cancer. The ABCD method tells you what kind of spots or moles should be checked by a doctor. A stands for asymmetry, so that is a mole that's asymmetrical. If you were to divide it in half, one side of the mole would be different than the other side. B stands for border. The borders are irregular, so they're not sharply circumscribed, but they have jagged edges. C stands for color, meaning that the color has some variety. And D stands for diameter. That's usually a diameter that's bigger than a quarter of an inch. So usually if it's bigger than the end of a pencil eraser. A suspicious spot could also look like a small bump, even light in color, or a red scaly patch. Montanette Bennett noticed a little bump on her ear. It was like a spot, an ordinary spot, a type of spot you would get on your face. For Montanette, who lives an adventurous life of travel with her husband, mostly in sunny climates, the news was surprising. Do you have any problems with it? When the spot didn't go away, she went to see a dermatologist who told her it was a squamous cell cancer. When do you know that you are healed completely? You'll see that there's no open sore there anymore. It'll be a little red, and that's okay. Montanette has learned that a diagnosis of skin cancer means reevaluating her relationship with the sun and its dangerous ultraviolet rays. There are two kinds of ultraviolet rays that damage the skin. Ultraviolet B, or UVB rays, cause sunburn. Ultraviolet A, or UVA rays, penetrate more deeply and tan the skin. Both types of rays can cause skin cancer. Tanning booths, which produce UVA rays, are not considered safe. A good way to protect yourself from the sun is to use a sunscreen lotion that can absorb ultraviolet rays before they penetrate the skin. When shopping for a lotion, choose one that protects you against both UVA and UVB rays. And look for what is called the SPF number on the bottle. SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor. The higher the number, the better the protection. Most doctors agree that people should wear at least an SPF of 15. Most sun protection products should be applied 20 minutes before going outdoors so they have the opportunity to bind to the surface of the skin and then are fully effective once the individual is outside. Of course, if someone is going to be immersed in water, such as swimming, then they need to use a waterproof or water-resistant product. But sunblock is not a license to spend a lot of time in the sun. Doctors warn that you should avoid the sun in its most intense hours, at around the middle of the day, from about 10 a.m. to 3 or 4 p.m., and whenever possible, cover up. But Sean Hughes knows that covering up isn't as simple as it sounds. A normal T-shirt offers the equivalency of only a 6 or 8 SPF. After I was diagnosed with malignant melanoma, I found that wearing normal clothing, I'd get sunburned right through it. So what my hope was is to, to try and find a solution that would safely protect me all day, every day, doing normal things in the sun. Ten years ago, Laura Abrams was diagnosed with a very aggressive melanoma. Like Sean, she is serious about protecting herself from the sun. Sunblock goes on the face when I get up in the morning, on the arms, on the tops of the feet, anything that's exposed to sun. I'm usually wearing long sleeves, unless it's kind of the ends or the beginning of the day. When I'm gardening, I'm always wearing a hat, and not a baseball cap, but a wide-brimmed hat. It's just part of my life now that I'm protecting myself before I ever go out of the house. Doctors say real protection from skin cancer needs to begin at a very young age. There's some good uh, statistics now that show that a uh, significant sunburn, a blistering sunburn in childhood, probably doubles one's risk of getting malignant melanoma uh, later in life. Come on, Ilio. Here we go. Janice Moses was diagnosed with a basal cell cancer on her face. The diagnosis has affected not only how she lives, but how she's raising her daughter. Well, we're only going to be here for a couple more minutes because we want to get in the shower. If I take good care of my three-year-old daughter now, this won't happen to her in the future. My generation, we didn't put on sunblock. Her generation, that's what we do. We wear a hat, she wears glasses, she gets sunscreen on, and she's great about it. 
A diagnosis of serious skin cancer means you may have some stressful days ahead. You might want to share your feelings with a support group or ask your doctor to give you the name of a patient with a similar diagnosis. In our next report, we'll look at your options for treatment of your skin cancer. Report 3. Treatment and Management. Your doctor will advise you on what treatment or management approach is recommended for you. It is important that once you have decided on a strategy with your doctor, that you do your best to stick to it. Make sure to take notes on how your treatment seems to be working for you and let your doctor know how you feel about your progress. The primary treatment for skin cancer is surgery or excision. This simply means cutting out the cancer. But often, with some very superficial skin cancers, there are simpler methods of treatment. With the treatment, I was able to tell that this was a very superficial skin cancer. The most common of these are called cryosurgery and curatage with electrodesiccation. Large words, but simple enough procedures to do in the doctor's office. If it's an early basal cell or squamous cell cancer, you have a few options. One of them is a technique known as a desiccation and curatage, where the surgeon initially uses a cure, which is an instrument that helps him feel where the cancer is, thereby removing the cancer, and then going after the base by using some electricity in a technique known as electrodesiccation, burning the skin cancer base. Does it hurt at all? No, no it just feels like a, a rubbing sensation, but there's no uh, pain. Another option is something called cryosurgery, where the surgeon uses a freezing spray called liquid nitrogen in order to freeze the skin cancer, destroying it as well. All of these techniques are done under local anesthetics, similar to Novocaine. Therefore, the patient feels very little, if any, discomfort or pain at all. But when skin cancers are deeper, they will likely be cut out surgically. The doctor can estimate the depth of the tumor and cut out enough to be sure it is all removed or the physician may refer you for a special technique that will show precisely how deep and wide the cancer is. It's called Mohs surgery. Ulicol is receiving a local anesthetic for Mohs surgery. The doctor cuts away the cancer one layer at a time. The layer of skin is sliced and put onto microscope slides. The surgeon can then check for cancer cells one sliver at a time. This results in a smaller, shallower wound, which is easier to repair and ultimately should give a better cosmetic result. Eula prepared for this surgery by taking advice from her husband, James, who himself has had skin cancers removed. We wanted to get it early while we had an opportunity, and I explained to her it really is not as difficult a procedure as she might imagine. We have just learned about methods for treating less serious skin cancers. But if melanoma has been diagnosed, more extensive surgery is usually needed. Surgery for melanoma can be simple or complicated, depending on the thickness or depth of the tumor. The question is, how much normal tissue should be removed around the tumor? The doctor is likely to discuss this with you in terms of centimeters. One centimeter is just under half an inch. We now know that by taking a one or at the most two centimeter width of normal tissue around the melanoma, that this is more than adequate. Um, to obtain the maximum cure rate. In some cases, the cancer will spread to nearby or far away lymph nodes, small bean-shaped glands that drain the tissues of the body. The surgeon might want to remove those nodes as well as the tumor. This is called a lymph node dissection. Experts disagree about whether lymph node dissection helps in the treatment of melanoma. Some people feel that for large lesions, that are somewhat advanced that they were removed at the time of surgery. Other experts feel that only if we can palpate or detect presence of tumor in the node should they be removed. But with or without lymph node removal, surgery for a serious melanoma can result in a large gap where the skin was removed, like this area on Laura Abrams' leg. 
Surgeons often close that gap or wound with surgical techniques called skin flaps or skin grafts. Laura's melanoma came back and she sought out a treatment beyond her surgery. This is called adjuvant therapy. One type is chemotherapy, where certain drugs are given, usually through a needle, directly into a vein. Laura has chosen another type of adjuvant therapy, called biological therapy, or immunotherapy. Every month, she is injected with a vaccine actually made from melanoma cells. The vaccine is intended to stimulate cancer-fighting cells in her own body. Like chemotherapy, it's considered experimental for melanoma, but it uses a very different approach. Chemotherapy assumes that you can't do anything on your own. It comes in and tries to kill the tumor cells, and in many cases will hurt some of the normal uh, cells as well. Biological therapy assumes that you have the ability to fight off the cancer, even if you've got an advanced cancer. It stimulates the immune system and other defenses. John Hughes, like most skin cancer patients, will never have a need for chemotherapy or biological therapy. An amateur pilot, he's now back in his airplane, flying high again. If I had malignant melanoma, all I wanted to do is have a normal life again. And with flying, I can go off and poke through clouds or go up on a sunny day and look down on the world and, and feel normal, feel free, feel like I can control things in, in my life. Report 4, Issues and Answers. By asking questions and discussing things, you give your doctor a better understanding of your specific concerns, and that's important. Do not hesitate to ask questions. In fact, it might help to write them down beforehand. You are not the first person in your situation to have those questions, and you won't be the last. I didn't know all the questions to ask because I wasn't very well versed in skin cancer in the first place. Asking the doctor questions can be difficult even if we do feel well informed. Here to help us talk about issues and answer some of our questions is Dr. David LaFell from the Department of Dermatology at Yale School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us. That patient just talked about it being difficult to ask the doctor questions. What should a patient ask you? What do they ask you? Well, the most important thing is I tell patients that there's no such thing as a silly question. I also make it very clear that if they leave my office without all their questions being answered, I haven't done my job. So to help this process, I recommend that patients develop a list of questions, talking to family members and others, so that by the time they come to see me, even though they may be nervous, they'll be able to go through all the different issues they want to discuss and hopefully will leave with most, if not all, of their questions answered. Most skin cancers appear on parts of the body that are exposed to the sun. But some skin cancers show up in places that never see ultraviolet rays. How can that be? Well, we know that sun exposure is just one factor in causing skin cancer. Genetic abnormalities, some of which we don't even understand, may underlie skin cancers that develop in non-sun exposed parts of the body. I see. Thank you, Dr. LaFell. We'll be back with you in a moment. But let's turn to another expert on the issue of sunscreen. What exactly does that SPF number on the bottle tell you? To find out, we asked Dr. Edward D. Simone, Associate Professor of Pharmacy at Creighton University. If an individual takes 30 minutes of sun exposure to develop a sunburn, the use of an SPF 15 will allow them to stay in the sun 15 times longer or seven and a half hours before a sunburn would occur. An SPF product of 15 blocks out approximately 93% of ultraviolet radiation. So if SPF 15 is good, does that mean SPF 30 is better? To some degree, it provides about 97% protection uh, and is especially helpful for people that are very sensitive to the sun. So an SPF of 30 should be used by people that tend to have fair skin and burn easily. Okay. If I'm at the beach or I'm sitting by the pool and I have on a t-shirt, do I still have to put sunscreen on the part of my body that's covered by the t-shirt? A normal t-shirt just provides an SPF of 6 or 8. Really, one can burn easily through a t-shirt like that. So to avoid that, 
one can purchase special clothing that has been designed to have a higher SPF. And is such clothing marked that way? Yes, it is. There are several product lines that are available. And uh, they uh, can be purchased at uh, sporting goods stores and clothing stores. Tell us about some of the latest advances in the treatment of skin cancer, particularly melanomas that are difficult to treat now. Well, melanoma, unlike many other cancers, is especially susceptible to the body's immune system, the body's own surveillance system. By harnessing the immune system in different ways through vaccines and other techniques, it may be possible to stimulate the melanoma to be rejected by the body. We've talked a lot about recurrence. If you've had one kind of skin cancer, say basal cell, are you at a greater risk for other kinds of skin cancer? Well, first, an individual who has had one basal cell cancer has a 40% chance of getting another basal cell cancer. In addition, patients that have had several basal cell cancers or squamous cell cancers do have an increased risk of developing melanoma. Probably what's happening is these people, by their very nature, are susceptible to the ultraviolet rays from the sun, and it's these same rays that are increasing their chances of getting melanoma. So the overall picture that I keep getting is that skin cancer is an area that we can really help ourselves by what we do. There's no question that in the world of uh, preventative health, so to speak, skin cancer is one that stands out. By protecting ourselves against the sun, and more importantly at this point, protecting our children against future sun exposure, we can really help them avoid developing skin cancer later in life. Thank you, Dr. LaFell, for joining us. And thank you for joining us. Remember, you can use the booklet that comes with the program to review key points and to take notes. You'll also find a resource guide and a glossary of terms that may be helpful. That concludes our series of reports on skin cancer. We wish you well.